I'll start, brother. Again, I want to thank you for being in our city. I miss playing. I'm going to be real playing language with you. Um, this is what I'll start with. Um, you flew in the Fred Shuttlesworth Airport. Mm -hmm. He's my favorite hero. So there's a book There's a book about his life, his entire life, from birth to his death, Call of Fire You Can't Put Out. Mm. Favorite book. Malcolm Gladwell is my favorite author, right? But it talks about the journey of his life and his fight around social justice. The importance of not only voting, but the importance of fighting for equal rights, um, supporting and fighting for black people, um, et cetera. We'll connect that to our race. We ran last year for an entire year, and we got over 5,000 people under the age of 35 to participate in a municipal election who had never voted before. Wow. So this whole thing about being uh, awakened, being woke, um, the importance of voting, we pushed it. Not just in Generation Boomer, not just in Generation X, but we're pushing Generation Y. Because if anything's going to change, just like it did 50, 55 years ago, it's going to take young people just like they were marching in the streets then. And they got to march to the polls today. In every movement, it's always the young people. Every time. Whether it's South Africa and apartheid. Every time. Civil rights movement here or things that are changing in Tiananmen Square in China. It's, it's always the young people, and uh, if you can bottle that up somehow and <laughs> make that a national uh, awareness, we would uh, appreciate that. Because as you say, it's, uh, it's not just a cliche to say they are future, they, they definitely are the future. They and, are. Uh, well, you met Dewan. On them. You met Dewan, I think what she's doing nationally, um, things can change. Uh, even in the Doug Jones race, uh, with people, the Senate, special Senate race, people thought he couldn't win. That's right. It was young people and black women 55 plus, those two groups. I and woke folks, thank you very much for, for spearheading <laughs> a lot of that, yeah. <laughs> the wanna put the work That's in. That's right, the wanna did. She put the work in. So the Magic City Classic, um, 77 year, you know that. What a lot of people don't know is those schools have been around Alabama State and Alabama and A&M for 150 plus years. Historical black colleges, you know, were at some point the only choice. But now there are many options. What we're trying to do with this classic is show people these two schools are not only still relevant today, but we want African Americans to exercise an option. The HBCU experience is like none other. I went to Morehouse, um, and I went to a majority white law school. But the foundation I got there has allowed me to sit here in this position as mayor now and have a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. So they can get the same foundation at A&M and Alabama State. So it's not just about the game and the band, which we appreciate, not just about the post game or you being the grand marshal, kicking it with us, which we appreciate. But it's really about education, how to support these two colleges and universities that are, are historically black to really change Alabama. Absolutely. Really change Alabama. Yeah, from the ground up. All the way, man. You don't have people out there just standing in the parade just because. They, no, they, that was uh, awesome and inspiring. I, that's actually the first parade I've ever attended. I'm 53 years old. I've never been to a parade. That's the first one. Um, and you can see in the enthusiasm and you can feel the, the energy and uh, how the importance that they place on it and the respect and pride that they have in their own tradition. And uh, absolutely, that's something that uh, is, is, is infectious can be capitalized on. So it's, it's great to be a part of it. So you and I... Um it was interesting about like where we were going to be. We passed by uh, an area called the 4th Avenue Black um, Business District, mm -hmm. and I thought it would be cool to press the flesh, talk to folk there, but then we probably wouldn't be able to have this conversation because everybody would be all over you. But where we're sitting in now, 16th Street Baptist Church, literally hollow ground, That's right true. beneath us, uh, not just four little girls. There was a fifth girl that a lot of people don't talk about that's still alive today. I like to talk about her because when she's standing before this church, which she did back in September during the anniversary or the commemoration, she talks about the importance of what we got to do now mm -hmm. to not honor them, not just honor them, but to continue to make sure their history, the story is told. And guess what it is? It comes all the way back to voting every time. Absolutely. It comes back to voting every single time. So here's what I think a couple of weeks is going to happen. If enough young people vote, America will change. Well, that's without question. I mean, America I think that statistically we can we can point to that uh, the metrics and say that that would that that would prove itself. Uh, 
And that's what it's going to take is is a message that gets to them that is somehow different, somehow attenuated a little differently than what they've heard. Because I think there's also a lot of mistrust. There's also a lot of doubt um, about, you know, the, the election process. And we're seeing all over North Carolina, be it Georgia, Florida, and all these cities where Texas, Arizona, that there, there are attempts to that are being made to disenfranchise people and to uh, to not let them be heard. And the only way to combat that, really, and the only way to uh, to push back at that is numbers. Uh, because if it's in the margins, people can always, you know, fudge it and be funny with it. But if, if we show up uh, strongly and we show up uh, in large numbers, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, dissuade us and to, uh, to, to marginalize us. So um, it's very important what you're doing. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, you're a testament to, to, to how it works. Like you say, you're a year in, coming up in November, right? That's we, great. We, it was all about inspiring younger people. That's right. A movement, like movements, man. And you, you've flown around the country enough to know that if you use the analogy of a flight and takeoff, it takes a while to, to hit your crescendo. That's right. You gotta build it. That's right. Like movements are built. And I think we're in a space now a couple of weeks out. Uh, folks keep pushing yeah. that movement. It, the crescendo can happen yeah. for the positive. That's right. The return we want to see when that polls actually close. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. But go, let's go light for a minute. I gotta ask. Oh, you've played a lot of characters. Do you have a favorite? <coughs> so I'm pretty sure you've gotten that question a gazillion. No, I, I just had it. Um, <laughs> a favorite? I can't really. You know, it's kind of like I'm in love with the one I'm dancing with at the time. <clears throat> and I've been very fortunate to have a lot of interesting roles and a lot of important roles. And I, and I say that quotations around it because, you know, I think, you know, I, we don't, I don't ever want to think of it as medicine. I understand that it's still entertainment at the end of the day. And entertainment doesn't just have to mean you're in there and you, you know, turn your brain off. You can be entertained and engaged and, and provoked. And uh, I've been a part of a lot of films that have done that. Um, the tears you had in Crash. Yeah. They were kind of real. Yeah. That was a real moment. Yeah. Yeah. Hotel um, Rwanda, real Hotel moment. Hotel Rwanda, you know, those were real moments. We had, you know, survivors from the genocide in the film uh, who were extras, and, and Paul Rusesabagina, who I play in the film, was there, and Tassiana Rusesabagina, his wife, was there. Uh, so we had people who actually lived through that experience with us day to day, and it's, it's you know, it's a similar feeling to when you walk into a place that, as you say, is hallowed ground. and and you understand the importance of what you're doing and you want to get it right, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's something that goes beyond just, you know, trying to do something to get an award or get paid or whatever. You right. go, I'm telling a story that's bigger than me and I, and I want the story to connect and I, and I want to make sure I'm doing it right. All right, it'll be just light for a few more time, a few more minutes. My favorite character, I already told you, two of them is easily Mouse mm -hmm. and Petey Green. Mm -hmm. Now you've done a lot of work but it's something about the, the loyalty of Mouse. Uh, and I'm old school. Right. I'm an 80s baby, so right, right. movies that I watched growing up in the 90s is different than now. Of course. Well, I appreciation of and it. And the movies are different. <laughs> <laughs> totally changed. Those movies wouldn't be made now. I don't think it'd be hard to even get Devil in the Blue Dress made right now. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Shout out to the Avengers, though. Yeah, thank you. Big, big ups. That young man right there is a big fan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, but I do have this connected to that point. Mm -hmm. Young people come up to me all the time, man. I mean, it, a day does not go by. I'm in the streets, barbershop, church, family dollars, like walking, it doesn't matter where we are, out to eat. They're inspired by what we're trying to do for the city. They're inspired by the age. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, whether they want to be an entrepreneur, start a business, be a musician, or be an actor, they always ask me the question, where do I get my drive from? What inspired me to do this? Where do I get my motivation from? How do you, how do you push through when people t tell you or told you you can't do it mm. or get through your fear? Is that the same question for you as, as far as growing up in the, in the Midwest, mm -hmm. making your way to LA and pushing through to where you are now in your career? Well, you know, I was very fortunate to have a beginning that you know either you have it or you don't where I had two parents that were very supportive of what 
I was doing. And I know a lot of people who, when they told their parents they wanted to be an actor, they were like, get out, you know, <laughs> or they were like, you're going to go to school and get a law degree, or you're going to become a doctor, or you're going to do something that you can trust and fall back on. <clears throat> and my parents were, you know, God bless, said, you know, you have to follow your inspiration, you have to follow your dream, you have to follow your heart, because that's where your motivation and your drive is going to be. And if we dissuade you and try to send you in some other path, and even if you become successful, you're always going to resent that and have that question. And my mom was a frustrated performer. So when I said that's what I want to do, she kind of, I think, you know, wanted to vicariously live through my experience and said, go do that. So in that way, I was really, uh, really fortunate. But as, as, as this business is and as all things are, you're going to bump into uh, obstacles, you're going to have roadblocks, you're going to have people telling you that, nope, you can't do it, you know, you're a black man in this business, you're bad for the business, quote unquote, you know, it's going to be very, it's going to be harder for you than it is. And, and there were times when I, you know, absolutely thought about, is this the right decision and should I give it up? And I didn't really have anything else that was inspiring me. I remember not getting a bunch of auditions and uh, calling my mom and saying, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I, if this is the right path and maybe I should think about doing something else. She said, you've been talking about wanting to be an actor since you were like 10 years old. She said, and you're going to stop now because it's a little difficult. She's like, don't. Push through. Yeah, push through. If you stop now, you're going to beat yourself up about it for the rest of your life. Don't stop. You know, if you give it your all and you don't get it, that's fine. But you got more, you got more push in you. Go, go, go push. And so thank you, mom. And I listened to her and, and did that. And I've just, you know, been very fortunate because I know a lot of talented people that cannot and are not in this position. Uh, so I understand it and respect it and uh, try to use my position to uh, hold the door open and bring others in. You know, that's why I started a company so that I could produce movies and, and put people to work. And uh, that's important to me, not just to go out there and get it for myself, but to try to really create opportunities for other people, marginalized people, people of color, LGBTQ, everything. You know. Uh, we all have a place and we all have uh, stories to tell and, and, and needs and loves and desires. And we're all people here that are sharing this planet. So we all got to show up. Do you, do you think the industry appreciates you? Like, like just you, and you think about everything you've seen, 80s, 90s, 2000s, late 2000s. You think they appreciate you? Well, I guess we'd have to define what appreciate means, you know? And, and at what level are we talking about? You know, I've. I've done movies where I, you know, basically had to bring my own clothes <laughs> and, and paying them to do it. And I've done movies, you know, like these Marvel movies, which are over the top and amazing and huge. Um, and I just think that it's a, it's one of those situations where, if we're going to talk about appreciate in terms of stardom or fame or whatever, you can look at it as well as I can. You know, the the business appreciates about six people. Do you know what I mean? There's about there's very few people that continue to be on the very top and the A-list and keep getting hired and pushed, and that's fine. And I actually wouldn't want that uh, to that degree because I know a lot of my friends, if they couldn't do what we just did, they couldn't walk around people with not, without an entourage and without you know, security and all that. I don't ever want to lose touch with that because that's really where I'm at, you know what I mean? And that's, that's, a, that's a joy to me. So I'm, I'm at a level that's comfortable to me and I can do the things that I want and I can create opportunities for myself and other people and my kids are you know good and out of school they're, they're college now. graduated they're adults we did it me and wifey crushed it so <laughs> <laughs> I can you know I don't have that stress around me as much anymore but uh, yeah I feel like I, I feel appreciated that's cool man that's cool commensurate to what I think of myself how, you're always uh, either underappreciated or overappreciated I think in this business, you're always people always. It's never like kind of commensurate with where you are, I th where you see yourself. I think people are always pushing you up or putting you lower than you are, and I think that's just a that's just a function of the business. At a kitchen table, uh, um, there's you, uh, there's Morgan Freeman, uh, there's Denzel, there's Sydney. Uh, and I'm missing a couple. What are y'all talking about? First, I'm saying, why are you guys drinking so much? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, take the wine. Must be off a lot the of table. Must be a lot of liquor flowing. <laughs> Whole lot. 
<laughs> no, we're talking about a lot. It's funny because I've had conversations with all three of those gentlemen. Um, and we talk about all kinds of things. I think everybody knows uh, their positions in the in this business and 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 the tradition that we're we're carrying forward and what our responsibility is. And right now, it just happens to be an amazing time in in Hollywood for Black people and Black men, Black women, and people of color. And and all the stories are now becoming stories that people want because the main color that Hollywood is concerned with is green and it's working out. So, you know, as, as long as those stories, just, you know, crazy rich Asians, they're like, yeah, let's get some more of that going. You know, what, Asi Asians go see movies? You know, it's like, wherever they see that there's an opportunity to capitalize, obviously, on an audience, they're going to do that. So when people ask me, is Hollywood, you know, racist? It's like, yeah, to a degree. It's, not, it's an institution in this country, and every institution in this country has that within it. And has sexism, it has ageism, it has all the isms, you know? Uh, is it more than any other? I don't know, not necessarily. It's, it's something that's representative of who you are, and it's, it's very different. It's easy to, you know, if you're in a corporation and you push papers around, you know, they're not necessarily having to look at who you are in your frame to discriminate against you. It's about your work. Our work is not, cannot be devoid of who we are. So if you're a woman, you're a woman. If you're a man, you're a man. If you're gay, you're gay. And that's something that's presentational in the front of who you are. But that all goes to the side as long as they think it's going to be profitable. So that's really what the bottom line is. And, it's, uh, and there are more opportunities now than there have ever been for people. And there's more outlets now. You know, I think there's 800 scripted shows on television now. That's I mean, a lot. I mean e a lot. everybody you can think of is now producing content. Apple, Google, YouTube. These are all producers of content now. They're all, you know writing films and, and, and producing television shows. So what's great about it is there's such a diversity uh, of, of, of places to, to create content. So people, a lot of voices are getting seen and you can kind of, you know, a la carte pick the kinds of things that you want to watch. So it's, very, it's, it's a very exciting time, I think, in the business for a lot of people. I'll chop it up with you one more issue because you touched on it. Based on it, the table you said, you used the word, y'all talk about responsibility. Mm. It seems like outside of your craft in regards to your civic engagement, your civic work, your community service, you've made voting a mm. priority. Mm -hmm. You've joined a movement to talk about this, to use your voice to amplify and communicate around vote, 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 the importance of voting. Mm. How do you share that with your other, I guess, colleagues in your industry because I feel like young people look up to y'all more than they do, well, or minimum as much as they do, professional athletes. Mm -hmm. well, so that responsibility, you got it. It don't seem heavy to you, you weigh it. I saw you, I heard you on the mic. It's pretty easy. Y'all need to vote. This is why you need to vote, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What do you say to your other colleagues to get them to join you in that movement? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we're going to talk about the Avengers for a second and, and just look at the lineup of people in that, I mean, from Mark Ruffalo, Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, I mean, th there are a lot of vocal people around this issue. Uh, Chadwick, you know, very vocal around this issue. And we just all did, uh, you know, a thing with the Parkland kids about voting and um, did a video and pushed that out. and. So we're very active on social media in that regard and uh, show up a lot. And I don't know if it just tends to be the people that you know you have the same vibrations with, but I tend to be around in my business a lot of activists, a lot of people who are, are on their weekends going to places like this and are showing up at events, trying to inspire people to come out. Um, and all celebrities, all you know, people who have a platform and have a voice and you know, I think that we ask ourselves, what is the benefit of having this position if you don't use it to some greater good? You know, yeah, we can just, you know, have the shine for ourselves and, and, and uh, enjoy what that offers us and, you know, be able to cut lines or, or whatever all the celebrity can do. But, you know, one of the best things to do with it is take the cameras and the light and the focus and the mic and shift it and towards people who cannot get in the light, people who are having uh, a difficulty being heard. 
And, you know, we just want to put our arms around those people and say, come into the light. And, and, and I'm just going to be a fullback. I just want to block and create the hole and then let you come through behind and, and, and say what you need to say and, 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 and show who you are and, and, and try to connect to those people out there who are also trying to find a voice. So that's something that is very easy for us to do. Uh, as, as, as celebrities, as people who, who have this platform, who have big followings on social media. Yes, and if you're not using it for that, uh, and you're just using it to get free stuff, it just feels very empty. Um, but, you know, and people ask me, do I think that is a responsibility? I'd say for me it is. You know, I'm not trying to mandate what anyone has to do with their life, but for me personally, if I were to have this position and not attempt to do more in it, I would feel like I was, you know, I would feel like I was bereft of, of some real energy. My mother just turned 65, mm -hmm. and I listened to her growing up. She was on the floor with us. I listen to her now. Yeah, she's and great, by the way. I love you, Thank bro. you, man. I'm going to tell her you said it. Please. There was so much racism in our country, so Birmingham wasn't unique to racism. What made Birmingham unique was that our racism was on the war displayed on the world stage. That's right. But at the exact same time, changing or fighting that ra racism, so reckoning with our differences was displayed on the world stage more so than any other city in America. And so that consciousness part was that everyone saw how bad it was, but at the exact same time with the exact same energy, everybody saw what it could be with us fighting it with Fred Shuttlesworth, with King, um, and so many other activists, young people, et cetera, et cetera, pushing through, fighting Bull Connor, fighting injustice, fighting racism. And so when we think about social justice, <laughs> the truth is we, we believe people in your industry have a role to play in fighting for social justice in 2018. Absolutely. And it's an unbroken chain from, from then to now. That's why it's so inspiring to be here and so uh, humbling to be in this church and uh, to, to connect those dots and to see that absolutely there's an unbroken chain. I mean, people think that's such a long time ago. You know, I was born in 1964. It's not that long ago at all. Um, and we are constantly uh, seeing that, you know, you take three steps forward and two steps back. And, it's never, it's never a fight that's completely over because we have never really grappled with it in a way that I believe is honest and, 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 and forthright. And now, as we see today, there are many forces that don't want to talk about it at all. And if you talk about it, you're the racist. Do you know what I mean? Where now, if you bring it up, actually, that's you, that you're being the racist. And if you would just let it go, somehow it would just fade away, which we know is preposterous. So. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fight continues and, and uh, we're constantly going to be uh, in a battle to, uh, to, to make our voices heard and to uh, continue to show up against adversity and hopefully uh, through the younger generation and, and, and ways that we figure out how to connect with them through social media, speaking on their terms and speaking on their level and bringing them forward that we will re-energize the movement and constantly bring new voices in that understand how important they are and that if they do not show up then and they are not represented then they have themselves uh, to 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 look at and fault but I think they have to understand that that their energy what they have to understand what that is and they have to be recognized for that and that takes people acknowledging them from high places as you said as you say, whatever this, that celebrity does have, you know, cachet, and there is, uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people put more, um, you know, stock in it than I think is sometimes valuable, but fine, the ones that are there, let's cherry pick them and let's bring them forward and let's have them come and acknowledge the young people and pull them forward. Like I said, we've had a very close thing with these Parkland kids uh, this last year, and they have, they're changing it. You know what I mean? They're, they took it on themselves. Al albeit out of tragedy, similar to this, uh, coming out of a tragic situation, people losing their lives, they've banded together and have forced an agenda.
and made people have to speak about things that they possibly didn't want to speak about and made people uncomfortable and agitated and irritated. And that's what it takes. We don't get to these things smoothly. You know, power is never just handed. I agree. It has to be wrested from the hands right. of those who hold it. And that can be done in many ways. It doesn't have to be violent and contentious, but it has to have energy and it has to be committed. And Two children, right? Two, yeah. You have two, son and daughter? Yeah. What are their names? Uh, Ty and Iman. So if Ty and Imani, Ms. Cheeto, and you are sitting in this church, nobody else, no cameras, I'm not here, none of us. You walk in, you're sitting in these pews. Tell us what's going through you and your family's mind, or what's the conversation, or what are your thoughts, or what's the, what's the emotion you feel? Well, you know, when you're, like I said, we're in this place uh, where this has happened, I think first we just, you know, probably just are thankful that we're all together still and that we're close because we know that doesn't often happen for families, you know, and we're very lucky to to be together. You know, I've, I've been with Bridget 27 years now, and in and, and our business, that's like dinosaurs. So, <laughs> we, you know, and, and our kids are, like I said, they're they're both working, they're 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 doing their thing. So we're we just are, are, are always we always realize how how fortunate we are and how humble we are about what our opportunities are. We travel a lot and we've been to a lot of places. We've been to shanty towns in South Africa and we've been to, you know, the, in camps in, in, in Uganda and places where they're child soldiers and real people in desperate situations. And it just, we just always appreciate where we are and what we have. Thank you so much. So I want to say this, then we're going to wrap up. Unless you want to say anything, add anything. Those people are excited that you're in town. I mean, the people of Birmingham, the everyday, them everyday folk out there, man. Common folk, common touch, folk go to work every day, they work in class. They are excited that you are a Grand Marshal, they're excited you're in town. And I want to say thank you for being a part of what we're doing and celebrating the 77th Magic City Classic. Well, I'm excited Real talk, to be bro. here too, appreciate you. Yeah, man. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Yeah.